Hello, welcome to Meet Your District Supervisor. I'm Nona Melkonian, and we're here with Supervisor and Board President David Chu from District 3. Supervisor Chu was elected to the board in November of 2008 and has served as board president since January 2009. We're going to get to know him and talk about the toughest issues facing the city. Welcome, Supervisor, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Nona. So tell us a little about your background, where you grew up and went to school and the kind of jobs you've worked. Sure. My uh, parents immigrated to the United States in the 1960s, and I was the first kid born in the U.S. And what motivated you to get involved in politics? Before I ran for office, I worked in San Francisco as a criminal prosecutor and as a civil rights attorney and really got to understand how much of a beacon to the rest of the world as San Francisco is for social justice. Are there any other issues that concern you that we haven't discussed or any other interests that you plan to concentrate on throughout your term as supervisor? Well, one of the things uh, that I have every supervisor works on is the relationship between our neighborhoods and City Hall. Well, it looks like we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today on SFGov TV's Meet Your District Supervisor. Thank you. We've been talking to Supervisor and Board President David Chu from District 3. Watch for the next episode of Meet Your District Supervisor when we'll be back with another one of our 11 city supervisors. For SFGov TV, I'm Nona Melkonian. probably think you know all about the Exploratorium. You came here as a kid or you brought your nephew here when he was visiting San Francisco. But have you ever been to the Exploratorium after dark? Did you even know there was a monthly party called After Dark? At After Dark, science mixes with culture and adults mix with other adults and there's no kids allowed. And every month there's a different theme to the party. This is actually the most common rock on the surface of the earth. The interesting thing is that most of this rock is covered over by the ocean, so you don't see it. I'm here with Eric Muller, who just did a really cool presentation on plate tectonics. Eric, tell us a little about what we just saw. So we just wrapped up a little section of um, a lesson on plate tectonics um, here at the Exploratorium in the webcast theater. I have been having so much fun here tonight. I got my scissors tattoo, but before we go, I'd like to thank Melissa Alexander for having us here tonight. Melissa, how did you know San Francisco needed a night like tonight? Well, thank you so much for coming. And I guess I would say that everybody that lives in San Francisco loves the Exploratorium. We're reluctant to push the kids out of the way during the day. So I knew that we needed to create one evening a month just for the rest of us to have a good time, the adults. There you go. Well, Melissa, thanks again, and thank you for watching Culture Wire on SFW TV. Hi, uh, I'd like to know if you can count, please. Oh, okay. Everyone deserves a bank account. And in San Francisco, anyone can have a bank account, thanks to an innovative program, Bank on San Francisco. With Bank on SF, everyone is welcome. Even if you're not a U.S. citizen or have bad credit, you can have a bank account. And qualifying for a bank account is simple. Just live or work in San Francisco and have a form of ID. Thank you. Okay. Okay, perfect. We started Bank on San Francisco six years ago to really reach out to folks here in the city who don't have a bank account. We wanted to make sure they know they have options, which would be more low cost, more successful for them than using check cashers. To find the account that's best for you, just follow these three easy steps. First, find a participating bank or credit union. Second, ask about opening an account through Bank on San Francisco. Third, bring some form of identification. Now you've opened your account. Simple, right? That's exactly how it was meant to be. You can even access your account online, set up direct deposit, and make transfers. It's a real bank account. And to help manage your new account, you can enroll in free educational services online. Just visit sfsmartmoneynetwork.org. We wanted to make sure everybody has a chance to manage their money successfully, keep their money safe, and avoid getting ripped off. What do you think of it? Doesn't it sound like a cool deal? 
It sounds very good, and uh, I think people should try that one. To find out more, visit sfsmartmoneynetwork.org or call 211 and ask for the Bank on SF program. No more hassling with these expensive check cashing stores. Now you can have a bank account. Let Bank on San Francisco help you open one today. Exactly 100 years ago, women were first allowed to vote in California, but the battle for women's voting rights, or women's suffrage as it's often called, was not an easy one. It took more than 70 years. It all began in 1840, when two women were barred from attending an anti-slavery convention in Europe. This prompted them to hold a women's convention in Seneca Falls, New York. At the time, women were banned from inheriting property, serving on juries, signing contracts, and voting in elections. Suffrage leaders like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony dedicated their lives to reform and campaigned vigorously for women's rights. Many feared women would be corrupted by politics and even argued it wasn't their place. Women in the 19th century campaigns had to convince male voters that having the vote wouldn't change anything, that women would still be devoted to the home and the family, they would remain pure, they would remain innocent, that having the vote would not corrupt them. In spite of opposition, reformers gradually built support through state and local campaigns and California was amongst the trailblazers. Selena Solomons in 1910 opens a club in downtown San Francisco on Sutter Street near Union Square that she calls the Votes for Women's Club. And she or offers lunch every day to the shop girls and the working women. And her idea is that if she can get the shop girls to come in and have lunch, then she can interest them in suffrage literature. And the, the lunchroom was a tremendous success. So there had to be a social transformation in the way people thought about uh, women's equality, women's rights, and women's role in society before you could have a successful, truly successful campaign. And what happened with women's clubs is they began to build the base of support for that, um, uh, that transformation, that social transformation. They pushed the boundaries of what was possible for them uh, outward, and they in began to engage in civic and public work. What followed were parades and rallies, door-to-door -door canvassing, street speeches, plays and pageants, reaching every voter in the state from San Diego to Sacramento. The eyes of the nation were on California in 1911 when male voters flocked to the polls and approved women's right to vote by a narrow margin. It was the sixth and largest state in the nation to approve women's suffrage. 100 years ago this year, we won the right to vote. This would have been worn around that time, around 1911, and here we are, dressed as they would have dressed. marching for a cause or voting in the next election. Make your voice heard and vote. I'm Nona Melconian. Thanks for watching.